Hi. I'm Roy. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, just to everyone here in the room with me, everybody joined in online, I just want to say welcome and happy Sunday after Thanksgiving. Man, just three days ago, we were placing ourselves enthusiastically and voluntarily into a Thanksgiving carbohydrate coma. Were we not? I'll let you on in a little secret. I have always wanted to preach a sermon on gluttony right after Thanksgiving. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? However, a brief glance even in my direction uh, would indicate that I am spectacularly unqualified to preach that sermon. But good news. Today's message is going to be just as relevant because many of us over Thanksgiving have gathered with our extended family, right? And some of your family members do not see the world the way you do because some of your family members are crazy. <laughs> but not all of them, right? Like some of them just aren't as right about everything as you are. Um, I wonder if any of you, did you find like over the holidays that it was impossible to have a constructive conversation about politics or faith or race or gender or sexuality or the best way to navigate a pandemic? Now, are, are any of those topics important? Well, Sure. Is it possible to discuss them without bringing deep division between people who disagree? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> to discuss things that are important, right? With people that disagree with you, but in a way that is productive and peaceful. Is there somebody at work, maybe, you'd like to be able to do that with? Maybe, I don't know, um, somebody at school, somebody in your neighborhood, teens. Imagine a world where you could talk with your parents about something important that you disagree with them about, and it would be a peaceful discussion, beneficial for both of you. Parents, what about a discussion like that with your children that doesn't involve a prescription for Provax. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, the Sermon on the Mount is by far the most quoted, most popular, most life-transformative sermon ever preached in human history. And Jesus, being brilliant, began it with the shocking statements that we call the Beatitudes. And like us, Jesus' listeners would have expected him to say, blessed are the winners. Like us, they would have responded, make us winners. Yes, we want to be winners, Lord. But instead, Jesus said, here it is in Matthew 5, 9, not blessed are the winners, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. I was curious how popular this peacemaking thing maybe is in our day. So I googled the phrase, gentle comebacks that brought peace. And uh, this is what I got. As you can see, the number one result had the phrase, savage comebacks in an argument. Even Google does not have a category for peacemakers. We don't cheer for people who make peace. We cheer for people who win, right? And nowadays, you don't have to be even with the person that you're going to win the argument with. That's what Twitter is for. For example, just an example. So Wendy's tweeted, the four for four dollar meal, a tray full of mouth filling glory. Burger King tweeted back, five for four dollars because five is better than four. Well, some random person tweeted, Wendy's, what are you firing back? To which Wendy's responded, edible food. 
Here's another example. Watch this. Do you go in the water or the ocean a lot? Are you? Because yes. some people hate the ocean. No, I like the ocean. You? I do. I like the ocean very much. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah. You must. You, do you float a lot in the ocean? <laughs> sure. What do you sink? It might be that cast iron heart. So what's our natural response to mean people? Well, be meaner and clever. Win the fight. See, we live in a world that preaches blessed are the winners when Jesus preached blessed are the peacemakers. Have you ever wondered like, what Jesus' listeners were thinking when he, they heard him say blessed are the peacemakers? Well, the people that they believed were the most blessed by God were the Pharisees. And when a Pharisee got disagreed with, do you think they were most focused on making peace or on winning the argument? Let's look at an example from Scripture. And when we look at this, you're going to see that the Pharisee way of handling a disagreement is so 2022 that it could have been last week's Twitter feud. In fact... It is so similar, we are going to read the exact word-for-word -word account from John chapter 9, beginning in verse 24, but in Twitter feud format. And the Pharisees, just to set it up, they're kind of getting into it with this used-to-be-blind guy. He used to be blind because Jesus healed him from his blindness, but Jesus did it on the Sabbath. Now, the Pharisees were not into that healing people on the Sabbath. So here's how it probably would have gone down if the Pharisees had Twitter. So the Pharisees tweet, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Well, not blind guy tweets back, I don't know whether he's a sinner, but I know this. I was blind, now I see. Pharisees tweet back, but what did he do? How did he heal you? Not blind guy. Look, I told you once. Don't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now the Pharisees tweet back. They curse at him. They say, you're his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses. We don't even know where this man comes from. Well, not blind guy tweets back. Why, well, that's very strange. <laughs> he healed my eyes. Yet you don't know where he comes from. We know God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Now, because of a small Twitter word count, he has to tweet again. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. Pharisees tweet back, you were born a total sinner. Are you trying to teach us? And at this point, the scripture tells us that they called for security, had the not blind guy physically removed from the temple. And I imagine at that point, the Pharisees' Twitter account would have been suspended. So it turns out people are treating each other with disrespect, with, with disdain, before anyone had ever heard of Democrats or Republicans um, or masks or vaccine, vaccines. See, I think the reason we don't typically see peacemakers as blessed is because we don't really understand what Jesus meant when he said peacemakers. So I'd like us to clarify a couple of misconceptions about peacemakers. Now, you want, might want to get out your notes. Uh, you received them when you walked in today. Uh, if you're online, just minimize your screen and click on the notes tab. And we're going to look at the misconceptions about peacemaking. And if you want to write this down in your notes, please do. Number one, peacemakers are not peace breakers. So if you know the truth, and you try to force the truth on someone else. If you believe it is your responsibility to make someone see the truth, you are a peace breaker, not a peacemaker. So you, well, you might say, well, well, what do we do? We just you know, keep our mouths shut? Do we compromise the truth with our silence? Well, no, because, and jot this down, peacemakers are not peace fakers. If you avoid speaking the truth to keep the peace, that is not making peace, that is faking peace. If you just give in to appease someone else because, you know, it's just a little too uncomfortable to voice your own differing view, you're not a peacemaker, you're a peace faker. 
No one is naturally a peacemaker. Most of us tend to respond to conflict by either breaking peace or faking peace. Now me, (laughs) by nature, I am a peace faker. Most of the biggest regrets in my life have come from the consequences of my making a choice to fake peace because I wanted to avoid conflict. Can I ask you, what is your most natural response to conflict or to disagreement? Is it to attack or is it to withdraw? If you find yourself in an argument and your most natural reaction is to talk louder and talk faster until the other person stops talking or starts crying, you are probably a peace breaker and you're prone to attack. However, if your most natural reaction in an argument is to get out of the room as fast as you can, you are probably a peace faker who is prone to withdraw. So how do you make peace? How do you live in peace surrounded by people who don't agree with one another or even with you? Great news. The Bible has an answer that is just as relevant today, right now, as it was when the Apostle Paul wrote it to a young pastor who was learning to lead in the midst of conflict and chaos and disagreement. And that is today's bottom line question. If you want to write it down, we're going to answer it. How do I become a peacemaker in a world of conflict? Here's the answer. And as we read this passage, I wonder if you can notice some of the secrets that are here. 2 Timothy 24 and 25 says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. In these two verses, God gives the seven secrets to becoming a peacemaker. And I'd like to pause, and I'd like to challenge you to take notes today. Um, If you're online, uh, you can take notes. You can download your notes afterwards. The reason I want to pause and challenge you to do this is because you are not going to remember these seven secrets, and you will need them. In fact, most of you are probably aware uh, of the tragic shooting that just occurred in the Walmart in Chesapeake, Virginia. And listen, I, I know almost nothing about the shooter, but I wonder... If he had a coworker who was a peacemaker, if possibly things could have gone differently. If you will pray through these seven secrets, if you will obey them, God and his grace will begin to transform you into the kind of person who is blessed because they're a peacemaker rather than just someone who wins or avoids an argument. Secret number one, if you want to jot it down, know who you are. A peacemaker is the Lord's bondservant. It's kind of like what we just sang. I am free from your ideology and my ideology because I am a child of God. Because I believe that God is good and his will is absolutely the best, I am his bondservant. I am not a Republican. I am not a Democrat. First, I'm the Lord's bondservant. I'm not an athlete or a nerd. I'm not white or black or Hispanic or Asian or any other culture or race. First, I'm the Lord's bondservant. I'm not poor or well off. First, I'm the Lord's bondservant. I am not, take a deep breath here. FSU, or Florida, or LSU, or Alabama, or even Georgia. First, I am the Lord's bondservant. Know who you are. Number two, if you want to jot it down, learn instead of defend. A peacemaker must not be quarrelsome. If your goal in a disagreement 
is to defend your position and win the argument instead of learn, you will be a peace breaker. This is how Solomon wrote it. He said in Proverbs 18, 15, intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. In every circumstance, in every encounter, intelligent people are always ready to learn. Let me ask you a question. When God inspired Solomon to write this, do you think he remembered how he designed our brains to work? Yeah, I think he did. I'm going to read the results of these two studies. I'm just, I'm just going to read them. Ready? Neurological research shows that when you get defensive, the amygdala in your brain sounds an alarm, releasing a cascade of chemicals into the body. Stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol flood our system. The amygdala also immediately shuts down the neural pathway to our prefrontal cortex so we can become disoriented in a heated conversation. In layman's terms, I don't know if you caught this, when you start arguing, your brain makes you stupid. <laughs> hey, I'm just reading the research, okay? Scientists have determined that dopamine, the brain's reward chemical, is intricately linked to the brain's curiosity state. When you explore and satisfy your curiosity, your brain floods your body with dopamine, which makes you feel happier and makes your mind active instead of passive. So if the other person starts to argue and attack, and you see yourself like beginning to get defensive, and your brain starts to shut off, you can turn it back on if you become curious instead of defensive. How do you do that? Shut up. Stop talking and ask a sincere question. Because if you go into defend mode instead of learn mode, well, let me ask you this. Husbands, quick survey. How many arguments have you won against your wife? Go ahead, shout out a number to me. Go ahead, your best guess. You are a wise man. The correct answer, gentlemen, is zero. Because when you win the argument, your relationship loses. Does that mean you don't talk about your differences? No, that would be peace faking. What it does mean is because your goal is to learn, not defend, you don't win the argument and lose the relationship. And the key to that kind of productive discussion is to shut down the cortisone that is pumping into your body and into your lizard brain when you're trying to defend your obviously superior point of view and pump a little dopamine, happy juice, to reactivate your brain by being curious and seeking to learn. You may be asking, yeah, but what if they're wrong? And I'm right. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been wrong at all about anything ever? Okay. Let me ask you this. Before you realized that you were wrong, did you think you were wrong? No. Of course not. That's why they call it being right. So follow me here. Since some time in your past, I know it's probably been decades, that you were wrong. Is it possible that you could be wrong again, like now? And if you're right, like what could it hurt to better understand the person who's disagreeing with you? And who knows? Maybe, just maybe, you're not right. Because... And please don't miss this. This is perhaps the most foundational truth in all of life. Ready? You're not God. Let me just let that sink in for a minute. I'm not God. Would you say that with me? Maybe type it in the chat online. Ready? I'm not God. 
One more time for those of you that maybe this is a new concept. Ready? I'm not God. And I can hear some of you thinking, yeah, I'm not God. Okay, you got me there. But what if what I think is scriptural? Hmm? Now, there's a plan for disagreement domination. I tell you what I think, and then I quote a verse from the Bible to prove that you are wrong and I am right. By the way, this is a particular effective strategy uh, with your wife and children. Let me tell you, your wife and kids just love it when you do this. You can talk to me about that later in case you think I'm serious. Now, it is true that we believe that the Bible is completely without error and inspired by God. But I found it's possible uh, to read the Bible with a bias towards supporting what I already want to believe. Have you noticed this? For example, uh, let me show you my life verse. This is such a great verse. I love this verse. It says, my child, this is Proverbs 24, my child eat honey for it's good. And the honeycomb is sweet to the taste. Now, this is clearly a command to eat dessert. And lots of it. But I've spoken with other people who say that if you read just the next verse, that it's a little bit more about wisdom, perhaps, than dessert. Well, if you want the blessing of being a peacemaker... Approach every conversation with a purpose to learn rather than defend. Secret number three, if you want to jot this down. Make the first move. See, a a peacemaker is kind to all. Because sometimes during disagreements, people start defending instead of learning And when that happens, you have two people fighting to win. Somebody's often going to get offended. And when that happens, God wants you to make the first move to resolve it. And these letters, by the way, that Paul originally, uh, that when he wrote them, he wrote them originally in the Greek language. And this phrase, kind to all, is also used in one of his letters to the Thessalonians. So right here in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, he says, But we prove to be gentle, that's the word, among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. So the Greek word that we translate gentle here is the one that we translate kind in Timothy. Well, let me ask you, what is the job description of an infant? It's to be selfish. Right? That's their job description. Wah, I'm hungry. Wah, I want to be changed. It's all about me, 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 me when you're a baby. And how does a nursing mother tenderly care for her baby? Well, when the baby cries, the mom goes to the baby to find out what they can do, like to help them so they can care for them. They don't sit in the other room while they cry thinking, yeah, I'll come help you once you apologize for that last diaper. That's not how it works. She makes the first move. She takes the initiative so that she can go and she can care for the baby. Here's how Jesus described it in Matthew 18, 15. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. So he, he says, you make the first move. You could win that person back. Look what Jesus says next, Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. He says, if you're standing before the altar in the temple, giving an offering to God, and you suddenly remember someone has something against you, leave your offering there besides the altar. Go at once and be first reconciled to that person, then come and offer your gift to God. So, if they have something against you, you go to them You make the first move to resolve it. God is concerned first about the relationship. So it doesn't matter. If you have something against them, if they have something against you, you are supposed to make the first move to be reconciled. Because time does not heal all wounds. In fact, if you ignore a wound, it will likely get infected. It will get worse, not better. 
Don't be a peace faker and avoid the issue. Be a peacemaker. Make the first move. And number four, if you want to jot this down, ask God for wisdom. A peacemaker is able to teach. Now, I'm not the most self-aware person on the planet. But I know this about myself. I am not as smart as I think I am. So I need to ask God for wisdom even when I'm 100% sure that what I think is right already. Well, here's how the brother of Jesus described it in James 1.5. He says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If we're in a disagreement, we need to ask God to help us to see the issue his way before we ask God to ask the other person to see the issue our way. Can I say that one more time? If you are in a disagreement with someone, you need to ask God first to show you what he thinks about the issue before you ask him to show them what you think about the issue. For God's sake, and I mean that literally, ask God for wisdom. Number five, choose the relationship. Choose the relationship. You see, a peacemaker is patient when they're wrong. It's always more rewarding to resolve the conflict than to dissolve the relationship. Even if you don't agree when it's all over, that's the better way. But you'll have to be patient because you know what? Most people are concerned with winning and not with peacemaking. And it was that way in Jesus' time. Like it's no different. That's the way it is now. That is why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, if you are a peacemaker, you will be called a son or a daughter of God. Peacemakers are so different than the rest of the world that Jesus said that people would look at them and they would say, well, I don't disagree with them, but the way they disagree with me reminds me of God. You will be wronged. So you need to be patient. You need to be forgiving. And by the way, God is not saying that you allow abuse. What he's saying, he says it in Romans 12, 21 as well. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So choose the relationship. And number six, if you want to jot this down, don't force them to see. You see, a peacemaker with gentleness corrects people. He corrects those who are in opposition. When you believe that you know what is true, you should share it with people who disagree if you're in a position to do it in love. You should. You should do that. But you should, you must speak it with gentleness. In the book, Crucial Conversations, which I highly recommend, by the way, uh, the subtitle is Tools for Talking When the Stakes Are High. The author says, you should imagine in a disagreement that there is a pool between you and the person with whom you're talking, with whom you're disagreeing. And the goal is simply for each of you to put your meaning, your perspective, what you believe into the pool. Now, to demonstrate how this might work, and I know I shouldn't do this, <laughs> this is a bad idea, I would like to know, is there anyone in the congregation today, by a raise of hand, that you believe you could articulate with me here on stage to demonstrate this, two reasons that... Florida State University is overall superior to Florida University. Is there anyone that has the capacity to do that? Uh, oh, wait, okay. We got a, uh, sorry, sir, sorry, sir. I, I've heard you like other schools too. All right, so. All right, so um, come on up. Uh, just come around there if you wouldn't mind. And... Uh, 
Oh, sorry. I'm usually supposed to telegraph if I move on stage. I don't know if you guys know this, but there are actually more people online with us right now than, uh, than are in the room here. So the camera guys don't like me to make sudden moves, but we'll see what we can do. All right. So uh, would, you, would you tell, here's your microphone. Keep it close to your, your mouth there. Uh, and so introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Brad. Hold on. There you go. Hey. Hi, I'm Brad. All right, so Brad, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick up a rubber ducky. Okay. Okay. And that's gonna that's going to to it's going to symbolize what you believe. And then I want you to tell me uh, a reason why you believe FSU is superior overall mm-hmm. to Florida University, and then put your meaning into the pool. All right. So reason number one. Reason number one. I don't know if you're aware, but we are state champs once again. All right, so he puts his meaning into the pool. I don't know if you're aware, but my, my daughter went to the University of Florida, so I, I could be biased. And so she told me this story. One weekend, she was uh, crossing through the campus. She was waiting to cross the street with a whole group of Florida students. Mm-hmm. And on a Friday night, preparing for the big party weekend, they were all talking about math. So it appears to me that if that is true, that perhaps Florida University is a place of such rigorous academia that it will help prepare them for the future. Okay? So meaning uh, meaning number two. Meaning number two, most importantly, they let me in. They allowed me. (laughs) I I like that little personal (laughs) testimony. Uh, So uh, I don't know if you're aware, uh, but Tim Tebow went to the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. I know, that, that's not even fair, is it, right? Uh, the pastor pulls a Tim Tebow card. Uh, he's yeah. a pretty epic guy. He's done a lot of good in the world. And so people uh, might associate the University of Florida some of the time with Tim Tebow. Uh, they might be introduced to Tim, and then Tim might introduce him to Jesus. True. So uh, I'm going to put my, uh, my... So, you see what happened. Like, he just said what he thought. And I really can't, it wasn't really much to argue with. I said what I thought. He kind of grunted a little on the Tim Tebow thing, you know. <laughs> but you see, we're still friends. Are we still friends? Yes, we are. All right. Give Brad a big round of applause. Thank you, Brad. You'll notice that Brad didn't grab my hand and force me to pick up his meaning. I didn't headlock him, hold him underwater, Until he said what I said. Be honest. Like, don't try to force anyone to see something. Be honest. And that leads us to the final secret to becoming a peacemaker, if you'll jot it down. Number seven, leave the results to God. See, a peacemaker knows that it is God who may grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Repentance, it's kind of a churchy word, but it just means to change your thinking, to think differently. And it's important to see, I hope you noticed when we read it, that to change someone's thinking, that is very clearly in this passage God's responsibility. You, you put your meaning into the pool, okay? And then you let God change their mind. I have been in pastoral ministry for a little more than 40 years. So I'm coming up on a half a century. It has been my job to help people change. But if I've learned anything in my 40 years of pastoring, it is this. You cannot make anybody do anything. So you say, well, do I ever do anything more than just, you know, put my meaning into the pool and see what happens? Well, yeah, there is a time to do more. If God has placed you wherever you are in a role of authority, then he has given you the responsibility to make some decisions. And you have to do that. He's given you the responsibility to administer consequences in response to the behavior of the people that he's entrusted you to, right? So if you're a parent, at some point, you're going to have to ground somebody or you're going to have to take away some privileges. 
If you're a, a police officer, at some point you're going to have to write some tickets. You're going to have to arrest some people who, when citizens act in a way that is either harmful to other citizens or illegal. But none of these things actually change people in their hearts where it matters. Do you have a part in changing people? Yes. You Number one, you must know who you are. You must learn instead of defend. You must make the first move and ask God for wisdom and choose the relationship and you cannot force them to see what you think is true. That is your part. And you must do that. And if you do your part, then perhaps God would grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. But if you don't do your part, you are a peace faker. But if you try to do God's part, you are a peace breaker. God is inviting you to be a peacemaker because this is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So we're going to put these seven secrets up. And I'd like to ask you, um, with your um, notes out, your connection card, rather, out. I'd like you to pick one of these. And I have to be honest. I am awful at this. Now, there's a certain circumstances where I'm okay, but mostly awful. So I, I, I'd like to try all of this, but I'm just going to be overwhelmed. So I want to ask you, as we talk through this, to choose one. And ask God this week to empower you to do this. Maybe it's to know who you are. You're a child of God. You're his bonds. You, you, you don't, you're not controlled. You're not bound to what other people think. Or maybe, and this is mine, you need to learn instead of defend. Man, I've been trying this. I just got to tell you, it's humanly impossible. Like, I don't know about you, but like if somebody crosses me, if they, you know, I, now I, I may not do it on the outside, but on the inside, I, I go into instant defend. I don't think about it. It's just the way my body works. But I need to learn. Maybe you need to learn to switch that, to ask questions, to learn instead of trying to defend what you think is right. Maybe you need to make the first move. Maybe there's someone that you're not reconciled with, and you need to just go to them. And try to be reconciled. Maybe you need to ask God for wisdom. Maybe you need to choose the relationship. You need to be patient. You need to forgive. You need to take time. And maybe you're trying to force somebody to see what you know is right. Maybe you need to just step back. And say that is not my job. Maybe you need to leave the results of someone, and usually it's the people we love the most that it's the hardest with. And you need, you need to just leave them with God to know that only God can change their mind, but God can, and he will use you if you do your part. So I'd like you to pick one and just write it down on your connection card to say this week, by God's grace and power, I will make progress in becoming a peacemaker in this way. And maybe you're here today and you don't know that you have peace with God. There, there's, there's still some question. Because all of us need to have peace with God. And the problem is, in Ephesians, it says that we are by nature, our very nature, objects of God's wrath. Because we, it's not a problem that we just made a mistake. Oh, you can, you, I mean, you haven't even kept the Ten Commandments, right? Not perfectly. In fact, if I told you your life depended on just telling me all ten of the commandments, most of you would be dead. You, you, not only have you not kept them perfectly, you don't even know what they are. All of us are like that. We've all sinned, 
And God is a perfect, holy, righteous, consuming fire of just, a God of justice. And he cannot be in relationship with people who are sinful like us. He can't let us into heaven. We'd mess it up. But he loves us. But God cannot fake peace. He cannot say, well, you know, I know you're selfish. I know you're a murderer. I know you're a cheat. Ah, don't worry about it. He can't, he can't fake peace because he's God. So he made peace. And this is how he made it. The wages of my sin, the punishment for your sin is death. So God became a man, Jesus Christ. And on the cross, he died. He took our punishment for our sin so that we could be made right with God. We could have peace with God. But if you're depending on yourself, you cannot have peace with God. You cannot do enough good things to make up for the wrong you've already done. And God says, all you have to do is believe and receive it. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Uh, if you're online uh, and you're able, I'd like you to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Same here in the room. And if you'd like to, if you've never really put your trust in Jesus to remove your sin so you can have peace with God, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you could just repeat it in your heart sincerely. Something like this. God, I know that I've done wrong. And I need to have peace with you. And I believe you love me, you died in my place, and you offer me forgiveness. I receive it now. Help me to follow you. And with your head still bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer with me, uh, and you meant it sincerely, would you, do me, would you just raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you today. Would you just raise your hand? Thank you. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. If you're online, you can click the button. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Would you all uh, look up at me again? My prayer um, is that every one of us will take some sort of step forward, empowered by God to become a peacemaker so that we could know that kind of blessing in our life. Um, if you would like to explore this a little further, uh, the book that I mentioned, Crucial Conversations, If you on your connection card, if you will just write summary. Uh, I'll send you for free. I'll email you for free a summary of that book. So you can maybe look at this a little more deeply. Um, and I, I want to say, I know that I may have raised a lot of questions for some of you. And so if that's the case, I want you to know I'll be here uh, after the service or out in the foyer. And if you have a question you want to explore a little further about this, I would love to speak with you about that. So I'm going to give our closing prayer now. And uh, those of you who are going to be praying for people, offering prayer, you guys can come forward now. Um, and if you would like someone to pray for you after I finish the closing prayer, there'll be some people here. And you can just come and they would love to pray for you. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a particular person in your life that you need to make peace with. Maybe there's a situation, a circumstance uh, that you'd like someone else to pray with you. We're going to have people here available to do that. God, as I've tried, I have tried to be this kind of person. I have failed over and over and over. God, I know that without the power of your spirit, it is impossible for us to become the kind of people who make peace, as Jesus described. And so I pray for every person here. I pray that you would empower us first to do something. And then to empower those actions to change us, to become more and more, not just people who make peace, but people who are peacemakers. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day.